thanks for everyone for having me here. I'm, uh, I'm very honored. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the potential ways we can uh, look at the patent system. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit uh, because it's, it's not going to be specific to the NIH, but I'm going to bring that in as we talk through it. So what I want to start this conversation with is we've heard the word innovation a lot. In fact, I'm actually not going to use that word in my talk because <laughs> the Latin for innovation or innovare actually means renewal. It doesn't mean invention, which is what the patent system was supposed to be about. So I think words mean a lot. and I think it frames our perceptions of things. And so when I heard the word innovation or I hear the word innovation as a lawyer and I look at all these patents, I think we're just renewing the same science in some ways and rewarding. So I just want to give that context out there and particularly in terms of the patent privilege. So when we look at the Constitution, the key words there are uh, limited times. And I, I say this as context setting for what I'm about to speak about. So just keep that in your minds as we go through the slides. And, you know, the economists can speak better to this. Uh, the more protection there is, the less societal benefits eventually. We get the initial benefits, but the longer the exclusivities run, the less societal benefits. And I think we're at that point today in terms of the exclusivity models that we are working with. So what I want to talk about is, first of all, is, is what I call the patent games. As somebody who's practiced in the intellectual property field, uh, acting for many of these multinational corporations, whether it be in pharma or other areas, I understand what it takes to try and protect your rights. I understand what investment means. I also understand, basically, the games that get played in order to preserve those exclusivities. So these are some of the words that you'll see banded around. Uh, I put the ones in red, which public health people tend to use in order to talk about the patent system and the games that get played, evergreening, strategic patenting, defensive patenting. And noticeably, if we look at the words in blue, how positive they are from the industry. Life cycle management, incremental improvements, incremental innovation. It makes it sound much better. We're the ones who are trying to actually uh, disturb the system and break innovation by talking about some of the behaviors that go on. So I think these words are important in terms of how we have these conversations. And as an organization, what we wanted to look at was, well, what's going on in the patent space? So I'm sorry this slide is very busy, but the idea is, is to show you the top 12 selling drugs in the United States and the number of patent applications that appear uh, in relation to these drugs. Eight of these are biologics, four are small molecules. And just to give you some averages, that's 125 patent applications per drug that get filed. 71 patents get granted. We've seen a 68% price increase on these drugs, bar one, which is Herceptin, over the last eight years, since 2012, and an attempted years of protection of 38 years, whether they get those years or not, because there are transaction costs in this. If I'm acting for a generic or a biosimilar company, I have to work my way through all these patents trying to figure out where can I get a space in the market. We don't talk about that. We don't put a cost on that. We just talk about innovation. And then I want to uh, recognize that uh, there's over 100 attempted patent applications by these companies on these drugs. So that's just the context setting. And just, just to break it down a little bit further, everyone's probably heard about Humira, and uh, Abvi is pretty renowned for its uh, aggressive patenting strategy. Uh, the first v uh, indication for Humira was approved in 2002, and they filed 89% of their patents after approval. Was that all innovation or invention, if you want to call it that? So there are a lot of strategic games, and this plays out. In, well, when you compare uh, the U.S. patent system and the number of patent applications that are played out in Europe, you see four times as many patents in the United States that are applied for than compared to Europe. In fact, Humira uh, launched as a biosimilar in Europe in the end of 2018, and the price dropped 80% by AbbVie's own accord. Here, we're still waiting for uh, biosimilars, and we won't get it until 2023 because of all the patent litigation. Every company has settled with AbbVie because they can't work their way through the patent thickets. And a similar story with Lantus. Most of the patents are filed after approval because they want to keep hold of the marketplace, or to use that Latin term, keep renewing. So 
bringing it back to what we're talking about here, I've got four short stories about federally funded drugs. First one is Ritonavir. This is work that uh, Aaron and I did uh, back in 2012 for a health affairs piece. We looked at the patent landscape for the drug uh, Coletra, which is a HIV drug, uh, second line. And the life of this uh, product started with a NI, uh, a NIAD grant, and uh, that was uh, under the patent 5142056. And Norvia got approved in 1996, that's for Ritonavir, which is what the grant, the patent covers. And then they combined it with another product, um, and Coletra gets approved. And 107 plus applications as of 2012 were filed by AbbVie. And that was a global sales at its height about 2012 uh, of 1.4 billion. And AbbVie today, I did a check, is still filing patents on this product. And I just want to use a term that Barvin actually brought up yesterday of sort of the NIH sort of takes the ball down the field and then passes it on and so the companies can keep running. And as you'll see at the end of the four stories, these companies don't stop running with those patents. They just keep getting them. So there has to be a point, what point is we really talking about real inventions here. Similarly with Lyrica, this has just come off patent and competition is now entering the market. It actually started with a very small grant to Northwestern University. Incidentally, Northwestern University didn't disclose the, um, the grant on their patent. That is on the Orange Book. Um, Lyrica gets approved in 2004, over 118 patent applications, and global sales annually of $5 billion. And what's, uh, what's really, I was reading about this on the North, Northwest, Northwestern University website, and um, the 18% uh, of uh, Northwestern University's endowment comes from this product. And that, uh, uh, in 2014, the licensing income was $360 million. And uh, Lyrica, over the six, eight, six years since 2012, the, average, the, the, the price increase was 163%. So it's in Northwestern's in interest for uh, Pfizer to keep these patents moving, to keep running down the field because it brings them a lot of money. It also brings uh, Mr. Silverman, who was the inventor, a lot of money too, because he cashed out. Cetagliptin, similar story. I mean, the facts speak for themselves. Merck has been renowned for not filing as many patents as a lot of these actors, but still, 41, a pretty, that's a quite a high number. And in fact, in Israel just the other day, one of these patents for a phosphate salt was actually rejected, but it still exists here in the United States. And again, global sales annually of 5.9 million billion. And finally, um, this is a story which has had a lot of press lately uh, regarding uh, PrEP. So here you have uh, four uh, government-related patents uh, which relate to the combination of uh, emtricitabine and tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, uh, originally combined as a HIV prevention medicine, but the uh, work of the U.S. government to identify the uh, pre exposure prophylaxis of the drug was uh, patented around 2007 and a new patent just actually uh, was filed in 2018 that was just granted. Um, again, Gilead is banking very nicely out of this, but this particular uh, uh, drug has, has raises a number of other issues. Here we have the NIH actually patenting use patents, i.e. second indications. and. When we look at the literature, I'm not going to be the arbiter here. Under the current US patent law, um, a combination such as this is probably patent worth, is uh, eligible. Uh, but if we look at the prior art, the individual ingredients, emtricitabine, was known to be a pre-prophylactic, prophylact had pre-prophylactic exposure, pre-exposure prophylactic uh, properties, as did TDF, what the NIH did was to combine the two. Was that obvious? I'll leave that for you guys to decide. So I'm going to bring it to the need for reform. I'm going to start broadly, but bring it into some of the issues which may relate to some of these NIH patents. I think we desperately need to modify what the standards are for patenting. I think for somebody like myself, who actually sits and reads a lot of these patents, and I'm not going to try and uh, uh, say that I'm a scientist, but I spend enough time with scientists who also work with me on these issues. 
And many of them don't speak up because they get grants, they get funding from uh, a lot of the places that they can't speak out against. But in secretly, behind the closed doors, they actually say, how on earth did they get a patent for this? And I think we need to bring the scientific community to become more honest and to stand up and have a proper conversation about what it really means to be inventive and what really is the issue. Is it really about just getting the dollars for investment? Let's not start calling things inventive and inven innovation just because you want to get the dollars. And we need to restrict continuation applications at the USPTO. Continuation applications, for those of you who don't know, means you can keep attempting to file the same patent over and over again. And so in the United States, which is the only country that has it, it's impossible to get a patent rejected virtually. There are divisional uh, systems where you can divide out a, a patent and keep applying for that, but they're not as uh, continuous as they are here in the United States. And that's why you see the high numbers here of the attempts at patent applications. It's because an examiner can reject, the company can refile, and it can keep refiling, keep retweaking, and also observe what the competitors are doing so that it can retweak its existing application in the system just to capture what the competition is doing. That's not a fair system. We want certainty of investment, but you also want certainty of competition. I think the challenge systems, these came through the uh, uh, Americans in Vex Act. These have had some uh, impacts, but I think we, know we need to go deeper. We need to expand the grounds that are on there. And I just want to go a step back. By, invent by modifying the inventiveness standard, I think it's important then because some of the NIH work and the pre-earlier research could actually be cited then as prior art. Because at the moment, the standards are so low that even if there is a pathway that was created by the NIH, it's, it still gets through. So I think uh, some of the work that the NIH has done could still uh, actually prevent some of these later patenting coming, coming, up, uh, coming about. And that then leads us to some of the other uh, solutions that people will be talking about in terms of where the NIH can actually have a role or the government can have a role in over the control of a product. And these are some of the reforms that are going on at the moment that are in bills. This is work that we've done with a lot of uh, uh, people on the Hill, uh, thankfully. But these are what I call around the edges. This won't solve the drug pricing problem. This is just basically transparency. It gives us a little bit more information. It won't bring the prices down. And I think regarding the government and, a and the NIH, I think we need to implement a stricter monitoring system. Uh, Barvin and the colleagues yesterday spoke about this a little bit. I think we also need to have a penalty for lack of disclosure, so that if you don't actually disclose it, you might lose it. And I just want to raise this as a question. Is the patent system the best incentive model for development and affordable access? And I'll, I'll leave this slide because 11% of industry's 2,000 revenue came from just new products, only 11%. Rest of it was from all repurposed science. And uh, to quote the, uh, the author of this piece, he said, for all the talk of innovation in pharma, a term used with loose abandon and even looser definition, the challenge of seeing a return on invention is a significant one. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you.